Um, uh, my name is uh, Elliot Newton, and as, as Maria said, I, I, my day job is a biodiversity officer for Kingston Council, but um, my spare time I uh, volunteer and help support and help set up the organisation Citizen Zoo. And for those of you who might not know uh, what Citizen Zoo uh, is, it's a very small organisation but it's very much has community conservation at its heart. We believe absolutely everybody can be a conservationist if they're given the right tools and uh, motivation and support and we really hope to put people at the heart of conservation projects and really be part of the solution uh, to sort of the ecological crisis that uh, is unfolding around us as, as we speak. So humans are very much said to be the, well, uh, driving the ecological collapse as we know it, but we think, you know, inspired communities who work to improve the environment around them can really be the true, true part of the solution to help us um, improve the planet's general ecological um, health. We very much believe in, in, in uh, the, the, the process of rewilding and a lot of people ask me what does rewilding mean and to me rewilding is an absolute spectrum. It can be rewilding a, uh, a windowsill, uh, just getting more <laughs> to, to vast, vast areas. So uh, we we'll can probably talk about that maybe in, in the, at the end if there's, a, if, if there's some, some questions. Um, but before I um, go sort of fly into the talk, I just want to do a real big plug for the amazing organisation, which is the Beaver Trust. And some of you may may or not be uh, may, may be familiar with the Beaver Trust. They do some fantastic work across the UK advocating uh, beavers as, as 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 incredible species. Um, so please do uh, go onto their website and support them in any way that you can. Um, they, they, it's a fantastic bunch of um, uh, very. Uh, beaver literate people who, who really know beavers pretty much in any than many but anybody else and they've been absolutely supportive of us in uh, investigating uh, the beaver within london and what sort of um, what sort of opportunities might may arise in the future um so yeah please, please do go and check them out but yes so beavers in london a lot of people might really rise sort of raise raise an eyebrow at such a comment but hopefully over the the next sort of um uh, over this, this short talk, we'll sort of uh, just introduce you to beavers because many people probably aren't too familiar with the species, even though we are uh, living in an era where beavers are very much more popular than they were probably even 10 years ago. Uh, and then we'll just talk about what we've been trying to do over the last year or so to try and investigate how beavers might have a part, may have a part to play uh, within the London context, which I think could be extremely exciting. Um, and, and, and then we'll um, yeah, hopefully have some time for questions too. Um, so, the beaver. Uh, well, it's Europe's largest ro rodent, as I'm sure you're all aware. It's not the largest rodent, um, which of course that title uh, belongs to the capybara, which is um, oh, got yeah, a South American, uh, a South, a South American species. Uh, there are two species of, of, of beaver that we have on the planet, the, the North American beaver and the Eurasian beaver. North American beaver is actually slightly smaller than the Eurasian beaver. Um, they they can, they can uh, get to be over a meter in, in length, and yeah, they are they are sizable creatures. If anybody's had the fortune to see a beaver, it really the size does does strike you back. And every time I see them, I'm, I'm absolutely in awe in awe of their sort of size. Um, they are of course um, herbivores. Um, I always. Uh, get a bit annoyed with C.S. Lewis and, and his books of Narnia, where especially in the film adaptations and, and, and uh, where, where they pose beavers in their lodge eating the fish, which, which obviously is not something beavers do. A lot of people think beavers eat fish, but of course they do not. They're pure herbivores. Even when um, in, in Scottish Parliament, when uh, beavers were being debated a few years ago, after even years and years of debate, still some politicians thought, what about the fish? They're going to eat all the fish. But no, beavers will pose no pros, so no issues in terms of predation of fish. Um, so something that a lot of people um, uh, need to, need, is it, yeah, if, a serious misconception that, uh, uh, that Narnia has a lot to answer for. So yeah, they, they aquatic plants and grasses, as well as obviously the bark of, uh, bark of trees and, and their leaves. So very much herbivores. Um, they are a, a, a species that is um, relatively gregarious. It lives in small family groups um, and they can produce like two to four kits every, every year or so. And, and then those kits will get pushed out, pushed out 
um, after a year or so where they've got to go and find another, uh, set up another uh, lodge somewhere. I thought to live for about um, seven to eight years in, in, good, in good habitat good conditions, um, and they are highly adapted to the aquatic environment. Um, unlike water voles, which uh, you may have heard when I did it, I was very fortunate to do a presentation to this group um, about a year ago and now about water voles um, it, and some reintroduction work that we're currently leading at Citizen Zoo at the moment. Um, but um, water voles are a species that are very poorly adapted for, for, for living in rivers, but beavers are very, very much a species that are highly, highly adapted to living in, in, in the river system. They have webbed, webbed feet to help them swim. They've got waterproof fur. They can hold their breath up for 15 minutes. So they really are very well adapted to living in that environment. Um, and one thing that I absolutely love about beavers, and actually rodents um, generally, is their, is their teeth. Um, they, they have uh, open rooted teeth, which means their teeth are continually growing throughout their life. Um, and 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 one uh, wow well, and they have to continually sort of uh, uh, chitter away at their teeth to, to sort of grind them down to keep them nice and sharp and also stop their teeth from growing out of control. Um, if you actually ever have the opportunity to sort of sit by a, a beaver lodge um, on the side of a river, I, I had the opportunity to do it a few times over the summer this year. You can actually hear them as they sort of start to wait, well, as they start to move around. You can actually hear them sort of grinding their teeth together um, as they sort of keep, as they're trying to keep their, they keep their teeth sharp. But they have that beautiful, I think, beautiful orange um, uh, or sort of uh, uh, colouring to their teeth. It's not because they don't brush their teeth. And that is actually um, a coat of iron rich protective enam enamel, which um, helps keep them really strong. So obviously the, the, their ability to fell trees is amazing. So, and that's purely because of their sort of um, dentition that enables them to do that. So yeah, absolutely fantastic, marvelous mammals that are well adapted to, 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 to live within rivers and, and forage um, uh, uh, sort of uh, vegeta vegetative matter. And they are true ecosystem engineers. That, that sort of word gets bound around quite a lot um, within um, ecology, but few, few species, maybe only humans and wolves can rival the beaver when it comes to actually the engineering and molding of landscapes. I believe they are really now becoming the antithesis of um, nature recovery uh, across Europe. Um, and they, just because their ability to mold uh, water courses and um, create habitat. Um, so as, as our understanding of beavers improves, there's so much research going on with beavers at the moment, um, which has been going on across Europe, for, in America, North America for years and years and years, but in more recent years in the UK context, we're now getting more and more research taking place, which, um, which, which is fantastic. And just really helping our understanding of what these creatures can truly do when they're restored back into their sort of uh, riverine systems. The most notable thing that beavers can do is actually help reduce flood risk by increasing the capacity uh, uh, by increasing the capacity of uh, river catchments to store water further upstream in the catchment. They be able to hold that water and stop it from um, uh, in causing flood risks further downstream. And there are studies now which demonstrate that they could decrease flood risk by up to 60%. So truly should be part of a nature-based solution that everyone should be, should be talking about up in Glasgow at the moment. Hopefully it's getting uh, a lot of airtime. I'm actually up to Glasgow on Friday night to try and, uh, for the weekend, to try and hope really um, advocate nature-based solutions and rewilding. And beavers are very much part of our toolkit. They're also very good at improving water quality. Obviously, that is a real issue um, in urban areas, but their ability to sort of create dams and filter water really helps to sort of um, uh, put a sort of filtration process that can really help improve the water quality of, of a catchment. And again, there's some really fantastic research which clearly demonstrates that. Furthermore, carbon sequestration, everybody's talking about carbon sequestration at the moment and planting trees. And I mean, you think that's the only tool we have in our ecological armory to sort of help sequester carbon, but that is not, of course, of course is not true. There are so many habitats that help sequester carbon. And a riverine system that has um, got a good ecological uh, assortment of species and a rich, vibrant habitat that has great ability to, with all the sort of various species and vegetation there to store carbon in the soil. Um, it really is, um, uh, should be again acknowledged as a very important thing that beavers can help do in terms of making our landscape more resilient to climate change. Preventing drought is of course another one because they'll be able to, as they as they are store water, they want to retain it within the catchment in the landscape. Um, that means that they, they can actually also help prevent drought as well by storing that water system. 
And also, um, biodiversity, hopefully that's what we're all here today to talk about. Um, but uh, yeah, they, they help create conditions in which nature can thrive. Uh, not least with sort of odonata and sort of our, well, an amphibian species, um, even our grasshoppers. I've got particular interest in large marsh grasshoppers because there's a project that sits into currently do, uh, looking at that. And if you look at the North American context, there's loads of, sort of they, they are a species that seems to be closely related with the North uh, the North American beaver. So that the, once you have beavers back in the system, it bounds with life, and you can really have these incredible nature recovery um, uh, processes that start to take place once you have these ecosystem engineers back in the catchment. Um, and it's not just uh, 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 it's not just sort of scientists and conservationists that really are pitching the use of beavers to help be part of our nature recovery solutions. It's actually also as a proposed tool in the, the WFD, the Water Frameworks Directive, which is sort of that the, the over-encompassing EU legislative legislature that helps to, to helps to inform um, uh, uh, water uh, catchment recoveries across Europe. So they really are um, a, a, a in, uh, a tool that everybody should be considering, um, uh, which um, hopefully is becoming more and more the case. And actually, over the last few years, um, you may have heard of many, many sort of beaver uh, 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 beaver releases, uh, beaver trials that have been taking place, as we are truly living in an era of the beaver. And across the UK right now, uh, so obviously including Scotland, we think there's probably about over a thousand beavers, free living beavers across the world, across the UK right now, which is, I think, would be a surprise to many people. Um, of course, when we, 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 we talk about the beavers, it's best that we're now living in this new resurgence of beaver reintroduction and beaver recovery in the UK, which is fantastic. But it's important that we look back into history and look at why uh, we lost beavers in the first place. Um, so the former range of the Eurasian beaver was, was vast. It was across Europe. Um, it was across uh, in, into Asia. And, they, and, uh, and uh, we were probably on the sort of um, uh, western extent of their their, their, their range uh, where, where, where we're sitting. Um, but in, in the 16th century, about 400 years ago, they were uh, hunted to extinction in the UK. I think European numbers collapsed to almost a thousand individuals across Europe. So they really were in a very precarious situation. And why were they hunted? Well, there was two main reasons for their sort of persecution. One was their incredibly thick fur that was used to help supply, um, help create garments and hats and stuff like that, just because it's ability to uh, uh, be sort of waterproof and, and thick and keep warm. But also um, potentially even more, more um, important was their castorium which is actually um, uh, something that beavers secrete out of their anal gland to help mark their territories because they are quite a territorial um, creature. And within this castorium, uh, because uh, beavers love eating things like willow, willow is full of salicylic acid and that is sort of the, 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 the sort of um, uh, chemical that helps, um, uh, is very much prolific in medicine like aspirin. So um, this, this castorian ha had a range of medicinal values which people uh, really looked to try and utilize. So that really created a market for the sort of persecution of these creatures. And that was why, um, in, why in the UK 400 years ago that we have, uh, have lost them. However, as I say, we're now in a resurgence. We're now in a positive time when it comes to the beaver uh, because we are seeing sort of this, this wildlife comeback, which truly is fantastic to see. And there's been significant interest um, across the UK. And it, it really, well, there's, it's been a long, it's a longer story than many people might imagine. Um, uh, but the, the real first advancements in the UK context were in Scotland uh, with the Argyle beaver trial and the various other sort of trials that took place in sort of enclosed environments. And of course, there was also um, a uh, unauthorised release onto the, the River Tay. So there were quite significant beaver populations that became established um, within the Scottish context. And in, in and then that enabled a whole body of research um, to take place, investigating their impacts within within the Scottish ecosystem and their impacts to farmers and and, and local ecology and, and local people, local communities. And actually, on the first uh, on the first of May, twenty nineteen, SNH and the Scottish government um, actually uh, uh, authorised the sort of uh, they, they sort of endorsed the um, uh, uh, the native con the sort of stated that it was now to be. Uh, 
seen as a native species once again, which sounds like a very positive first step, but actually it wasn't as positive as many people first had hoped because it said they were only allowed to expand um, into the ra in, in their range naturally, which meant they weren't actually advocating more proactive releases. It was more just an allowing what beavers were there to sort of stay and, uh, and, uh, uh, and not really advocating too much of a proactive approach subsequently. However, that is starting to change. And one awful thing that was happening quite a lot in the Tay was lots of beaver killings. And we'll actually come to that a bit later in the talk because that has complicated, that has um, very positive uh, connotations for potentially our context as well. Um, many of you are probably also aware of the River Otter in Devon, which um, is the, the sort of like the, the UK, the English beaver trial. Um, some uh, beavers that uh, colonised uh, the, the, the river. Um, I believe there's our 14 families uh, of beaver living uh, uh, within the otter. Uh, they were unofficially uh, released, uh, but then DEFRA decided to do a trial on them. And in August 2020, after uh, they were given permission to stay, and there was lots of fantastic research and, and actual management plans that were developed, uh, working with Exeter University and the Devon Wildlife Trust, which really helped further our, well, I suppose not really further our understanding, because the understanding people had researched beavers for many years in the European context and so that the the Scottish context where people wanted to redo that research in England just in case we're different as many people like to think um, but of course the, the results were pretty positive and we've just already described some of the amazing things that beavers can bring to our river catchments. So now we are as I say we're really in the era of the beaver we're seeing beaver reintroductions take place and being considered um, across the UK. Some of you might have watched uh, Spring Watch, which I think was on last week, um, and they were up at Wild Ken Hill in Norfolk, and actually they've got uh, well, probably the largest beaver enclosure that we have in the UK just there, and they've had beaver kits there already, which is fantastic news. So we're seeing more and more beaver trials taking place and releases taking place, uh, which is, has got to be deemed as a positive step in the right direction. But how does all this apply to London context? That's obviously what we're here to talk about this evening. Um, and I, before we sort of really get into that, I think one thing is we everybody needs to consider is what do we want London to be? What, do, what how do we see London developing in the future? We know our urban environments generally are so important for people because that's where most people live. Within the UK context, I think 82 to 86 percent of the UK population live in urbanised environments. And what do we want these environments? where all our people live. Do we want them to be nature depleted environments that are grey and lifeless where people um, you know, aren't going to sort of um, and not, not be overly resilient to climate change when there's high levels of disconnection with nature? I know the people on this call today, I know we can all say there is a wealth of uh, biodiversity in London with sort of 16,000 species recorded. But, you know, uh, I think the general connotations are can, can, lay people can be sort of they are grey sort of lifeless environments. But I think if we really want to strive for our environments to be resilient for climate change and sort of nature rich, which can help address the d detachment that many people have with nature and help make a more sort of happy, sort of vibrant, aesthetic, stimulating place to live, we have to consider all the tools that are out there in our sort of ecological armory. And one thing that we are post, uh, post, uh, sort, of, uh, sort of presenting is that do we think London or beavers could be part of that um, solution? Obviously, it, it will have to be context specific, but I think there are many opportunities where we could at least consider it and potentially um, uh, uh, welcome beavers back into our catchment. Again, from a historical, historical perspective, obviously beavers were here in London uh, for, for, for thousands, uh, if not more, millennia, uh, uh, which is, is really interesting. Um, something I'm really trying to do is try to actually get uh, understand the history of beavers within the London context more, more, more strongly. Um, there's obviously going extinct over 400 years ago within the UK. It means that records are very difficult to find. You have to find strange letters between farmers and stuff. But one thing I would love to work out is can we develop a better understanding of the distribution of beavers as, as it would have been 500, 600 odd years ago and when, where the last beaver in London went extinct would be a fantastic, fascinating thing to, thing to know. Um, but of course, we look across our landscape um, there are signs in just some of the uh, some just some of the the, the terms that we, we or names of our places that can help us give an indication or clue if to beavers previous existence. 
And this here is a river that hopefully many, many of you, I'm sure, might recognise. I, I myself live in South West London, I live in Kingston, and we have a part of the Beverly Brook that goes through, uh, goes through our borough, and this is part of it where it goes through um, Richmond Park. And it is thought that the Beverly gets its name from the beaver colonies that once lived, lived there. And um, if you went back, I'm sure, I mean, you know, 2000 years when the Thames was this big wet, wetland of marshland and, uh, you know, fish filled rivers with birds everywhere and deciduous woodlands and our hills, I'm sure beaver, beavers would have abounded here. Oh, but obviously London is a very different place now with almost 9 million people living in it. So I think when we're looking at this, when we're sort of putting this, these questions forward, we have to look across the world. Well, where, where do beavers live in urban environments and urban connotations, con, uh, connotations across, across the world? And actually, there's a really good uh, a lot of examples in urban environments where beavers do thrive in the urban context. And we can learn so much from these, from these, from these examples. And here we're looking at Vancouver. Vancouver has a population of about two and a half million people. And this is in the heart of Vancouver. So if anybody's been lucky enough to go to Vancouver, it's obviously a great place. Obviously it's surrounded by wilderness, but its urban heart is pretty urban. Um, it has Big Stanley Park, which is on its sort of, uh, uh, it sort of uh, borders the main sort of urban area. But in, in, in recent years, beavers have started to move into sort of downtown and central Vancouver. This here is the Olympic Village, and there's a big pond, as you can see from that picture, the sort of big high rise buildings surrounding it. And we have there, there are beavers that live and thrive in this environment. In fact, they become local celebrities, local schools bring their school children down to sort of uh, admire and watch the beavers from, from the bridges as they make their dams. And they use all sorts of, they're very sort of, they're very, um, they make all, use, use all sorts of uh, uh, materials to make their dams. Um, they are very sort of ingenuitive creatures. Um, and the, the more they're in sort of context that they've not been studied before, the more we can learn about them. But yes, so they are in the heart of Vancouver. They're also in uh, across Europe, uh, Bavaria, all sorts of area, places. They live in urban areas. Berlin, for example, in northern Berlin, there's thought to be about 100, 150 to 200 free living beavers. Um, and the, uh, there were actually at first there was quite a lot of anger towards the beavers when they started recolonizing these areas. But now they've been accepted. Even the, the Berlin police say the beavers should stay and they are manageable and they should be well, they should be part of their sort of urban landscape. So if they can do it in Berlin. Again, it hasn't got the population of London. There's about 3.5 million people in Berlin. But again, very heavily densely populated places and definitely things that we can we can learn from we can learn from. Now if we look to the UK context and the more, more in urban, urban environments. Um, this is the Tay here, Perth, um, where there are three living beavers that have been uh, recorded within sort of inner inner urban Perth. So we have urban beavers um, um, here. So so yes, so we know that they can live in these environments, and we we, we must recognise that they are very sort of adaptable creatures that can probably survive and actually thrive in areas in environments we wouldn't first recognize or consider. But of course, with any animal, with any wildlife, there's always going to be some level of competition and conflict. And beavers, being the ecosystem engineers that they are, do bring a whole array of um, uh, potential issues that might bring them into conflict with local populations, which makes them the, the controversial species that they have somewhat become. However, these are all um, conflicts and issues that can be relatively easily resolved. Um, so firstly, uh, beavers have a tendency to obviously um, cut down trees. And one thing I didn't actually mention earlier, which is quite important when you're, under when you're understanding beaver and ecology, is why they're trying to, why do they try and make their, make their dams to flood areas? And because they are herbivores, uh, because they are trying to move around um, the environment and try and find good food for them to eat. They're very, uh, as, you, as, as you all recognise, they're quite sort of tubby, not very mobile creatures on land, and they still think they live in a world which has occupied by wolves. So they want to be able to navigate the landscape in a better, uh, in a way in which they can feel slightly safer from predation. So that is why they make their dams um, and uh, try and flood areas to enable them to forage over greater areas. Um, but so if we have trees um, in London, which I'm sure many of us recognise trees and we don't want to see felled for various reasons, but they're a very easy 
um, methods that we can adopt to stop trees being felled. Very easily, we could just put around a very sort of thin wire mesh. It hasn't got to be thick, but the beavers don't want to sort of damage their teeth. So as soon as you put a wire mesh around the tree, um, that, that can uh, protect it from any potential uh, predation. Um, and even more simply, beavers don't like the taste of sand or the, the grit into their teeth. So if you paint the base of a tree with um, um, a sort of sandy paint, that will protect that tree from um, sort of being felled. So very easy, low cost, um, methods that we can adopt to stop our trees being felled if we don't want those trees to be felled. And also beavers being the large mammals, the large rodents that they are, they and the very sort of slow breeding as well, they're only producing a sort of small number of kits each year. They're not a species that's going to explode and sort of travel vast distances uh, without us um, without us uh, sort of uh, having the opportunity to sort of, uh, uh, um, sort of help control that. Um, so one thing that beavers love eating is apples. So what all you need to do if you want to sort of, if you have a problem beaver that needs to be moved, all you have to do is plonk him down in, um, uh, uh, put down a trap with an apple in it and that beaver will quickly be attracted to that apple and then you can close the trap and then you can move the beaver. So being the large mammals they are, you can move them pretty, pretty, pretty easily. Um, so what have we been trying to do within, um, uh, what have we been trying to do uh, uh, over the last year? And what we're trying to do is really trying to address two sort of scenarios that we think um, we should be discussing um, to sort of talk about how beavers can be uh, used with, within our context. We, all we want to do is facilitate a discussion which is inclusive and just get people sort of thinking about well, what, what opportunities may arise and what challenges may arise in the future. And the first scenario is how do we prepare if beavers start to naturally recolonize our water systems, our waterways? And Kent, for example, probably has about 100 to 200 free living beavers in it as we speak right now. And these beavers are expanding. Um, and so that means there's a high chance in the relatively near future, even within the next 10 years, beavers may naturally start to recolonize Greater London's waterways. So how do we prepare? How do we react if beavers just show up we, um, and, and unannounced in, in our London rivers? I think we should be prepared for that, have management systems in place, know what to do so we don't panic if these fantastic creatures just start to miraculously or just appear on our rivers. So that is something as a discussion that I think we should be having now and really starting to sort of think about. And also, can we identify areas within the London context where we think it'd be feasible to try and release enclosed beavers to demonstrate the ability that they have to sort of bring all these ecosystem services to fruition and inspire people about the nature rich environments that our urban environments could support if we allow them to do that. So they are the two things that we've been trying to discuss. We've been bringing lots of organisations together to have these discussions and um, it's been really positive so far. And one thing we would like to do is we want to set up this London Working Group, which is a core group of organisations that have the agency and ability to drive forward general sort of um, action in this. So, and really sort of commit themselves to the beaver cause, so to speak. Um, and we're, and we're, we're bringing that together and we're actually working with the Beaver Trust and a number of organisations right now and carrying out site visits across, across the capital to look at opportunities where we might be able to establish um, uh, the uh, sort of beaver uh, release enclosures, which would be fantastically exciting, I think. We also want a wider working group. So we recognise that not all organisations are going to have the capacity or ability to engage uh, full heartedly in this um, uh, uh, sort of process. Um, but we we'll want to say something, we we'll, we'll might want some input and want to know, keep informed. So we want to create a wider working group, which will enable people to learn about and talk about and discuss the issues and challenges that might arise as we move forward. And of course, the public is so important. I think that one of the most special things about beavers is having the ability for them to inspire people. So we want to create a public forum that can raise the profile of beavers and sort of demonstrate what the, the power they have to, uh, you know, just raise that profile and get them people more involved. One thing we would love to do, we actually tried to get some funding for it, but we haven't actually secured the funding yet, but we're still very much on the course of trying to do this. But we want to undertake some level of mapping exercise, working with Giggle and potentially other parties too. And here we want to map two things. We want to map the social context of London. We want to try and understand from a sort of a, a public perception um, uh, uh, side of things, what areas across Greater London might, might people be, uh, 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 
receptive of beavers being reintroduced into their landscape. Um, if people are just like, no, we don't want them here, then obviously that is going to be a big barrier. So it's best to focus on areas where people are going to be pretty much receptive to them. And also ecologically, we want to do some habitat mapping and work out where the rivers, uh, where, where, where the opportunities might might be most, most, most um, uh, great. So Tommy, you read The Guardian, um, which I imagine many people in this call do. Uh, you would have read a few months ago that uh, it said Citizen Zoo has now released beavers in Tottenham. Um, that wasn't quite correct, unfortunately, even though there's some really nice press to receive. Unfortunately, it wasn't entirely true. Um, however, Enfield Council are doing some fantastic work in, uh, in that area, where they've done lots of wetland creation. And I believe they have got a beaver license in at the moment uh, within Natural England to, to try and uh, to, to do this. Uh, and we're actually inviting the lovely people of Enfield uh, Council and uh, I think Thames 21 to come and do a talk to our next London Beaver Working Group to understand how, how they're getting on. But no, we had not released beavers in Tottenham. But what we did receive here was lots and lots of um, it made absolute waves across London. Uh, people were getting in touch with us left, right and centre saying how fantastic, congratulations that you managed to do this. And we were like, wow, that's obviously really positive to hear that we're not getting sort of people getting out of their sort of pitch, pitchforks and uh, very disappointed to hear that this has happened. But actually there was so much excitement. So I think this demonstrates the sort of public perception around the species and the excitement it can bring. And people want, uh, there's a real need and I think a real urge to make our city wilder. And this, this could be a real opportunity. And if just two weeks ago, there was some really good news that was actually probably reported slightly more truthfully and a very positive day for beavers. And it was actually a landmark win for beavers. The amazing charity, which is called Trees for Life up in Scotland, um, took SNH, uh, Scottish Government, to court about all the beaver killings um, that had been taking place, especially on the Tay in recent years, because there's been absolute massacres of these beavers. And absolutely, uh, it was Fantastic news that all it, it, the Scottish government ruled that all historic beaver kiss, killings were deemed now to be illegal and beaver killings are going to be illegal moving forward, which is which is very, very, very positive news. It really is a step change to how beavers are, uh, 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 can be treated within our landscapes. And what does that mean for London? Well, what that means is there's going to be more and more beavers now that need to be moved. They need to be found. They need to find receptor sites because they can't just go around shooting them, which is obviously great. So now there's going to be hopefully a bigger pool of beavers that we can use to try and um, actually try and bring to more appropriate areas across the UK. And perhaps London could be, part, could be a, a, a donor site for some of these beavers. Another thing that's really interesting at the moment that I urge everybody to have a look at is the DEFRA consultation that's currently underway. Um, uh, so um, I mean, we can maybe circulate this link, but give it a click um, if you get the opportunity to try and do a quick sort of DEFRA consultation on, on beavers because it is a, um, a, a interesting uh, thing. and gives you an opportunity to say why you would like them uh, and why you want them back and hopefully not why you don't want them. But um, of course, everybody will be welcome to express their own opinions. Um, so hopefully that gives you a sort of a whistle, well, slightly longer than a whistle stop store, I always talk a bit longer than I expected to, um, of, of, of what we've been trying to do, a bit more context of what beavers, how the beaver role within, within London. If you'd like, please do Google Citizen Zoo uh, or follow us on Twitter. We'll, as I say, we're, we're going up to COP tomorrow um, and trying to really advocate rewilding nature-based solutions within our um, armory, uh, uh, how to be, uh, sort of address climate change and inspire people. Uh, so please do follow us and uh, yeah, you can check us out and uh, support us any way you can. And uh, I just want to very quickly show you this video, which everything everybody must see is a beaver eating cabbage, because uh, if it doesn't put a smile on your face, I don't think you're human. So I'm just going to play that for a second. But it hasn't got sound, so I'll leave it there. But thank you very much for listening. <laughs> thank you.